Hey everybody, my name is Matt Icefire Shooty, Commander Air Group of Virtual Carrier Airwing 11. I'd like to welcome you to this new series of videos we're doing on the DCS FA 18C Hornet. This is part of our indoctrination process and has evolved to what it is today. Every new entry into CBW 11 must take these classes in order to become full fledged members in our organization. Our chief instructor is Homer. Let's listen in as we do class number one, the FA 18C In Depth Systems Overview. Enjoy. But what we're going to do, we're going to start on the back left. All the way back and all the way back on the back left. You see a switch back there labeled MC. I do. Uh, MC, you know what that stands for. As, as you're probably aware in aviation, they love their acronyms. Um, so MC, <clears throat> Mission Computers. Okay. Uh, the, air, the airplane has two mission computers. Uh, you probably never use this switch in here, but you can turn off mission computer one or mission computer two, you know, if you had a reason real world to actually want to turn one of them off. Uh, in real world, mission computer one does your uh, navigation. Mission computer two does your weapons delivery. So in one, when you're loading waypoints and making a flight plan, all that is done in mission computer one. Miss Computer 2, when you're setting up your dumb bombs, you're going to do a C-SIP drop and, and space, you know, do a multiple and, and uh, space them out 500 feet apart. All that's handled by Miss Computer 2. Uh, the next switch up, do you see what that switch says? Is uh, Hyd ISD? Yeah, Hydraulic ISOL, Hydraulic ISOL. Isolation. Hydraulic Isolation, you have a normal and override. Um, any idea what that switch is going to do for you? And this is something you will be using for an engine out procedure in the airplane. If you have an engine failure, uh, the right engine, you'll be using this switch. So on the top, you got hydraulic system. On the top left, you see hydraulic one, left AMAD pump. And on the top right of this, you see hydraulic two, right AMAD pump. AMAD. Another acronym, Airframe Mounted Auxiliary Drive. Okay. And AMAD is a drive unit that has several items mounted on it. One item on each one of these AMADs is a hydraulic pump. You also have a, a, a fuel pump and a generator and an air turbine starter, ATS. What an AMAD does, it's called an auxiliary drive because... What you have in this turbine engine is we have a planetary gear uh, that's rotated by, uh, I think it's rotated by the fan shaft. I have to check with the uh, shrimp on this. But this planetary gear rotates uh, around from this fan shaft where it rotates a satellite gear which drives a shaft that comes out of the engine and goes into the AMAD, the auxiliary drive. Once it goes into the AMAD, it now turns gears in the AMAD that drive your hydraulic pump and your fuel pump uh, and your generator are all driven off the AMAD from the engine rotating through the shaft to the AMAD driving those auxiliary units. Uh, the one thing that doesn't drive off of it is your air turbine starter. The reverse happens when you start an engine up. You supply air to the air turbine starter. It rotates the AMAD which in turn rotates that shaft, it rotates the engine, this pulls your engine up for starting. Again, all that's done through your AMAD. Your okay. hydraulic pumps. Each engine has a, an AMAD, each side has a hydraulic pump. So we end up with two hydraulic systems on the airplane. Each one of these pumps will put out 3,000 pounds of pressure, 3,000 PSI. And what they've done is they've divided the output of each pump into two separate systems. You'll notice on hydraulic one, you see hydraulic 1A and 1B. 
and those systems are color coded by all black and then the checkerboard. And on the right side, we have hydraulic 2A and 2B with the stripe line and the polka dot line. Yep. So if we look at, say, hydraulic 1B up there, and we come out of hydraulic 1B and we make the first right turn, and we come straight across, we come to a valve. And if you look on the right side of our diagram under the legend, you'll see what that valve is called. You see that over there? Uh, let me see here. Uh, check valve. Not a check valve. Oh, wait, look wait, wait. At Switching valve. Switching valve, right. What that little diagram is showing you, you see the ball in the valve, right? Yep. Behind that ball, those little circles represent a spring. So let's su suppose, and, and certainly I don't know exactly how much pressure, but let's suppose that spring puts out about 300 pounds of pressure against that ball, keeping that ball seated on the right side. In addition to that, we have hydraulic system 1B putting out 3,000 pounds of pressure. So between the spring and hydraulic 1B, we have a total of 3,300 pounds of pressure against that ball. On the other side of that ball, we have hydraulic system 2A putting out 3,000 pounds of pressure. So you see that? Yep. So now, once we go through that ball, we go to the left leading edge flap. So we can see that hydraulic 1B is going to provide hydraulic power to the left leading edge flap. But okay. should 1B fail and the 1B pressure drop, now hydraulic 2A is going to overpower that spring push that ball the other way, and now it will supply hydraulic pressure to the left leading edge flap. Gotcha. What that means is hydraulic 1B is the primary source of power to the left leading edge flap. Hydraulic 2A is the secondary source of power. So you have a primary and a secondary, so you have a backup source of power to operate that left leading edge flap. You'll notice on the right leading edge flap, it's reversed. 2A is the primary backed up by 1B. Right. Now, look at the ailerons. You'll see those are primaried and secondaried. The left aileron's primary is 2B. It's backed up by 1B. The right aileron primary is 1A backed up by 2A. I see that. If you look at the trailing edge flap, you'll see there is no primary and secondary. They are dual powered all the time. They're very, uh, uh, insistent on keeping the trailing edge flaps powered all the time. Okay. You'll see there's no primary and secondary there. Right. If we look down at the stabilators, we see the stabilators are dual powered. In addition, there is a third source of backup to the stabilators uh, by that switching valve above them. They're really serious about keeping those stabilators hydraulically powered. And then down at the bottom, we have the rudders, which are again, dual powered. Yeah, I mean, not dual, but primary and secondary. Right, okay. All of hydraulic system one, the only purpose of that hydraulic system is to run the flight controls. System one doesn't do anything else in the airplane but operate flight controls. System two also does flight controls, and then system two does everything else in the airplane. If you look on the bottom half of the diagram on the left side, you see the gun, the refuel probe, main gear, nose gear, launch bar are all operated by system two. Your hook, your speed brake, your nose wheel steering. On the right side, we've got parking brakes, brakes, and of course your anti-skid that works uh, with your, in tandem with your brakes to provide your anti-skid protection. 
All that is system two. Now, if we come up to hydraulic 2B and follow that line straight down until we get to a shutoff valve, right there about halfway down is a shutoff valve. You see that valve depicted on there? Yep, looks like a right straight edge uh, screw head. Right, it does, yeah. And it's showing that valve in the open position. If you rotate that valve 90 degrees, the valve is closed. Right. You'll see on the upper right up there above that valve, the name of that valve is called the aft isolation valve. And it's depicted in the open position. You see that? Yes. Right below there, it tells you the two things that will open that valve. One is W on W. What do you think that is? Uh, weight on wheels. Weight on wheels. And whenever you land, that valve opens. What's the okay. other thing that will open that valve? The hydraulic isolation override. Bingo. There's the switch we're looking at right now. Hydraulic isolation to the override position. What you're doing is you're opening that valve in flight. Not when you're on, on the ground, the valve is going to be opened by automatically. But right. in flight, that valve is going to be closed. So in flight, we can use that switch to open that hydraulic isolation, uh, that aft isolation valve. Now, if we follow the fluid coming through that valve, we come down to another little, another little valve down there, and, and that's on our legend up there, and that's the one you said earlier is called a check, check valve. valve. Yeah. That's another name we have for this is a one-way flow check valve. What it does, it'll allow fluid to go down, but will not allow fluid to come back the other way. You can see that half ball with the spring behind it. Right. If, you fly, if you apply pressure coming the other way, it's just going to push that ball up to the stop and stop the fluid from going backwards. So it's a one-way flow check valve. So if we come through that one-way flow check valve and we make a right turn and go straight into the APU accumulator, right. that's that light you see on the nutshader panel there, APU accum, right? So what is an accumulator? Uh, it's you like know a, what it, so isn't it like a, a reservoir, build up pressure, kind of holds it in case it, it needs it? It does exactly right. It it does exactly what it says. It accumulates fluid and pressure. Now the way they do this is, um, if you could picture, I mean, this ball and imagine inside this ball, right in the middle, going from the top to the bottom, there's a rubber bladder. What you can't see is on the right side of this ball, there would be an air valve, just like the air valve you have in your car tire. Like a, like a Schrader valve. Right. And what the maintenance will come out to do is they will take a nitrogen bottle and they will come out and they will pressurize the right half of that accumulator. And I can tell you, uh, in, in the accumulators we had in the 747, they were pressurized up to 750 PSI. I believe this accumulator is pressurized up to 2000 PSI. So they pump in this pressure and it'll push that rubber bladder up against the other side of that ball when it's empty. Now, when we start up engine number two and that hydraulic pump starts producing pressure, that 3000 pounds now comes in into that accumulator and it'll push that rubber bladder back over to the right until that 2,000 pounds of pressure is, is, is compressed up to 3,000 pounds matching the accumulator, matching the, the system pressure. Right. And now that fluid is saved in there by those two check valves you see and the arming valve, which will be, uh, which will be closed in flight. The primary so the valve is that, is that first valve. Right below it. 
Yeah. Below it. Okay. Yep. You see where it says arming valve open? That's that first valve right below it. That's now, one thing on this diagram, you see that hand pump on the left? Yes. That is that is not in the cockpit. That is actually located in a wheel well used by maintenance to service the uh, pump up the uh, pressure in the APO accumulator. Ah, I got you. That's not something we would ever have access to. So, the primary job of the APU accumulator is to do what? Just to... Uh, it says store, it right store above it. Store pressure. Yeah, but what's the primary job of that accumulator once it has that pressure stored? Start the APU. Start the APU. That's the primary job. What is the, what is the APU? The auxiliary power unit. Yeah. Well, actually, you know what? What we call it, uh, APU. Since it's in the air, in the airplane, we sh we call it an aircraft power unit. All right. An auxiliary power unit would be one they roll up on the ramp. Oh, we call that a GPU. Ground yeah, power. the ground power, right? Uh, so it's a little baby turbine engine back there. Cute little baby engine. They're so cute. You see them when they're first made and all. <laughs> Um, anyway, you know, in order to start a turbine engine, you have to make it rotate. A couple of different ways you can make a turbine rotate. You can use a electric starter. Uh, you can use air pressure for a pneumatic starter, or you can use hydraulic pressure for a hydraulic starter. That's what we're using on the, on the APU and the Hornet is a hydraulic starter. Well, this one, the primary job of the APU accumulator is to start the APU. It also does some other things, too, that we'll look at here in a minute. But primarily, start the APU. What's the primary job of the APU in the airplane? Start the airplane. Start the uh, turbine. Provide pneumatics to the starters. Right. The ATS, right. air turbine starter. That's all the APU does. There's no generator on it that doesn't do electrics. All it does is start the air for the engine starter. Bleed air. Use the bleed air. Bleed air. Yep. So, yeah, if we leave the APU accumulator and continue down the line, the next thing we hit is the arming valve. Three things will open that arming valve. What are they? Uh, weight on wheels, uh, emergency probe, and emergency gear. Right. Any one of those things will open that arming valve. Weight on wheels, that's going to happen when you land. So when you land, you're going to get the aft ISO valve open and the arming valve is going to open. But in flight, we can open that arming valve by actuating the emergency gear or by actuating the emergency uh, refuel probe. Either one of those will open that arming valve. So if you do a refueling probe, you see that valve right to the left of the arming valve. So if you select emergency extension on your refueling probe, you'll open that refuel probe valve, which in turn will open the arming valve, which in turn will give you APU accumulator pressure to be routed to your refueling probe. If you ever have to do this, your probe will stay extended for the rest of the flight. So it's a one-shot deal. Well, it's... However, yeah, however much uh, pressure you have, yeah, right. So if you see the next one-way flow check valve, I see it. and you see the brake accumulator there on the right, work the mm -hmm. same way as APU. On the left, we have the emergency gear valve. So if we select emergency gear extension, that is one of the things that's going to open that arming valve above it. So you're going to take APU accumulator and you're going to get brake accumulator pressure and route it to your main and nose gear for extension. I see that. See that? Yeah, up to the left. Yep. Right below your brake, your emergency gear valve is your parking brake valve. And we know we use that on the ground. And below that, we have an emergency brake valve. If you activate your emergency brakes, now, of course, you're going to be on the ground when you activate those, those so the arming valve is going to be open. So if you do emergency brakes on the ground, you're going to get APU accumulator and brake accumulator pressure available to your brakes. Okay. 
All right. That is the the basic hydraulic system here in the Hornet. So just know that that hydraulic isolation to override, all it does is open the aft ISO valve in flight. Got and that. the only reason to do that is to charge the APU accumulator. That's the only reason you're ever going to be opening that valve in flight is to make sure that APU accumulator is charged. Gotcha. Okay. So let's go back in the cockpit. Uh, next, we come up um, to the OBOG switch. Uh, what is OBOGS? Another acronym for what? Onboard Oxygen Generating System. Yeah. Where does it get the O2 to work from? Atmosphere. No. Uh, not, well, of course, it all comes, you know, everything comes from the atmosphere, but moisture. specific, not moisture, but it actually takes that of bleed air. Oh, bleed air. Okay. Yeah. That is one of the functions of bleed air is to provide O2 for the OBOG system. Gotcha. Um, the difference between this jet and earlier Hornets and earlier jet fighters, it was the LOX bottle. You know, earlier Hornets had LOX bottles in them. Your liquid oxygen supply. Yeah, some dangerous shit. Oh, it is. Uh, but the other thing about it is you have a limited amount of supply of O2 available to the cockpit. Uh, once you breathe out a LOX bottle, it's done. With an OBOX system, as long as you have an engine providing bleed air, you've got oxygen. So, you know, no longer are you worried about breathing out a uh, O2 bottle. Uh, now, right below there, you got a uh, you got a flow valve that's set to on right now. What I want you to do is close that valve. And then we're just going to sit here a minute and watch it. Da, 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 da. You'll notice everything's starting to get blurry and dark and fading out. <laughs> now, be sure and open that back up before you die. You see that? Oh, that's kind of buggy. <laughs> and it uh, technically it is. What it's doing is in DCS, they you know you're wearing your mask. If you shut off your flow, you're going to suffocate. Well, in real world, that will not happen. At least and, not on the ground with your canopy up. <laughs> well, yeah, all you have to do is pull the mask off. But even if you left the mask on, you can on these masks you can inhale hard enough that it will open a relief valve and open that oxygen system to inside the cockpit. And you will still be able to breathe with the mask on. So the idea is the mask will not kill you in the airplane. If you were to pass out, and for whatever reason that flow were to stop, eventually you'll inhale hard enough and you'll open that valve and you'll still have O2 available to the, you know, from in the cockpit. Uh, available to you. So the mask won't kill you. Roger. Uh, now, up on the sidewalls there, you've got some antenna selector switches. I see. Uh, you'll probably never mess with those in the game. Uh, the COM1 antenna you have in real world, what you have is, uh, this is a UHF radio. Uh, UHF is, is what? What does that stand for? Oh... Uh, ultra high frequency yeah yeah uh vhf uhf it's the same it's right you know those bands start right above your fm radio band but they're all line of sight signals that means the signal can be blocked it can be blocked by obstacles it can be blocked by terrain um in the hornet uh, your number one comm has two antennas, one on top of the airplane, one on the bottom. Number two comm only has a bottom antenna. So in the Hornet, in flight, you will use the bottom antenna. That's going to give you your best broadcast coverage, you know, below your airplane for a line of sight. On the ground, uh, your airplane may actually block the signal from that antenna to the tower. So the airplane will automatically shift to using the upper antenna. And that's what that switch does. Says. It says auto right there, uh, which means uh, it automatically changes from the upper to lower 
depending on whether you're on the wheel, weight on wheels or weight off, weight off wheels. Again, you'll probably never mess with that switch in the game here. The other switch is for your uh, IFF. And there are two antennas for that, upper and lower, and it's set to both. Uh, you know, we don't have any reason to ever change that. Uh, the next two switches down there, you've got a relay switch and a G transmit selector. You'll probably never mess with those in the game. Next, you have a manual ILS channel selector and a uh, switch to select either your UFC or your manual selector to, to channel up whatever ILS channel frequency you want. Uh, as far as I know, this manual switch does work. If you select manual and put it on whatever the ILS channel is set to, you'll pick up the ILS. But you know the Hornet can only receive uh, carrier ILSs. It, uh, it does not have the radio equipment needed to pick up a ground-based station ILS. Um, the, Aussies, the Aussies had all their radios changed because they don't operate carriers. Right. All their Hornets can pick up ground-based stations. I think the Canadians have the same thing because they don't right. have carriers. No carriers either. But in the U.S., our Hornets are on the carriers. They don't have the equipment to pick up a ground-based station, only the carrier. So if you have to do an approach at an air base, it's going to have to be a TACAN approach. Uh, below that, we have your IFF controls. Those are all preset, even though the IFF is not functioning in there yet. Uh, you know, our control up front is not functioning yet. Right. Uh, in front of that, we have our volume control panel. That's all preset for you. You'll notice your tack end volume on your bottom left is turned down. All the others are turned up. Uh, in front of that, we have our FCS uh, control panel. You have your reset button. And then you have a gain, which has a normal and override. You know what that gain switch does for you? I was wondering. No, I actually don't know. Uh, what it does is, uh, in the simple term, it kills your wing. It gives you a dead wing. What that means is, in normal operation, when you're out here flying around the Hornet, watch your flaps, your leading and trailing edges. They are constantly being adjusted for whatever you're doing to maintain the optimum uh, aerodynamics over your wings all the time from your FC, from your flight control system. If you select override, you take that control away from the wing. What it does in your flaps in auto, your wings go to a cruise position. I think it's both leading and trailing edge go three down. Um, and that's where they stay. They don't change at all from there. Uh, half flaps gives you half flaps. Full flaps give you full. You notice uh, on the ground, whenever we start up and we select the flaps to half, do you remember what position your, LA, your leading edge flaps go down to? Uh, no, I don't. They go down 12. Oh, the, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Tra yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. Your, your trailing edge at half go down 30. Leading edge go down 12. In flight, you know they're different? In flight, your leading edges go down 17 at half. So on and the that's, ramp... And that's the one that you change uh, for whatever your weight is, right? No, that's your that's your stab trim for that's takeoff. That's your stab trim. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about the leading edge flaps. Well, yeah. What you do? Watch it when we when we start up on the ramp. Uh, initially, we set our flaps to half. You'll see the leading edges go down twelve. When you're in flight and you're coming into land, and you put the flaps to half or full, your leading edges are going to go down seventeen. After you land, they go back to twelve from a weight on wheels shift. So for takeoff, it just wants 12. For landing, it wants 17. That's all a function of your FCS system. If you turn that, that FCS gain to override, your leading edges go down 17 with the flaps extended and stay there. Well, it doesn't matter whether you're on the ground or in the air. 
So that's what I mean by it kills the wing. You know, the wing is no, you know, your FCS is no longer controlling uh, leading trailing edge position based on whatever you require in flight. Gotcha. Uh, to the left of that, we've got a rudder trim, and on top of that, you've got your takeoff trim button. If you push the takeoff trim, where does it put your stab? 12. 12, yeah. We know for the carrier, we need a minimum of 16 for takeoff. Uh, if you don't have 16, at least 16 in there, and you push the throttle up, you're going to get a deedle deedle. Right. right? Okay. <laughs> yep. Uh, but on the ground, you I mean, on a, on a field takeoff, uh, you won't get a deedle deedle. Um, to the left of that, you got your engine crank switches. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Right above that, we got APU start. Again, nothing new there. Push your throttles all the way up. So now, uh, next we're going to look at the fuel panel here in the Hornet. Uh, the fuel system in this airplane, they've really simplified it to help with the single pilot type operation in here to make it easier on the pilot. So there's really not much you have to manage. But starting just to the right of our APU, we see that guarded switch, which is your uh, uh, refueling probe. See that? I do. What position do we get to if we selected aft? Emergency extend. Right? We, you now know if you pull that switch aft, you're going to open that emergency refuel valve. In turn, it's going to open up the arming valve, and it's going to give you a pure accumulated pressure out to your refueling probe to extend your refueling probe. This is the fuel system in the Hornet. Your main fuel system in the Hornet are the four centerline, the four fuselage tanks. Then you have two wing tanks. They've numbered those four tanks, tank one, two, three, and four, and they've also named them. Tank one is also called transfer left. Tank two, left engine feed. So that's the tank that's feeding the left engine. Tank three, right engine feed. Tank four is also the right transfer tank. So fuel goes from four to three and from one to two. And then we have the wing tanks. Uh, do you know where your dump valves are located, where the fuel dumps from in the Hornet? Uh, from the wing tip? Or not the, uh, wing not the, no, no. Right above, I'll tell you, quick, let's go back, uh, go back into your airplane, go back into DCS, and hit F2, and come around to the back of your airplane, look straight at the back, at your vertical fins. And right above your rudders on both sides, you see a slotted opening. You see that? I see it, yes. That's your fuel dump right there. When you dump okay. fuel, it comes out of those slots. All right, Roger that. Okay, so back at uh, back at Chuck's guide here. Uh, so we have these four fuselage tanks, two wing tanks, and then we have the ability to carry an additional three uh, external tanks. What you have in the airplane is you have a fuel computer that manages the fuel for you. It decides when to take fuel from which tanks and where to put that fuel. It decides when to start taking fuel from the external tanks and where it's going to send that fuel when it takes it in order to keep your airplane at an optimum CG or center of gravity. Right. Okay. All that's managed by the... Also, at the same time, it's going to manage it down to where each engine has the same amount of fuel available to that engine. You'll notice if you ever look at your DDI page after you've been flying for a while, you can look up on here and you'll see both feed tanks will be matching each other. All that was managed by the fuel computer. Okay. Gotcha. It's all automatic. You, the pilot, that's, you know, it's like Ron Popeil. You, you just set it and forget it. 
So let's flip back in the cockpit now. We do have some controls here, though. And so right to the right of our probe, we have two switches. You see at the top of the switch, switches, it says external tanks. And the left one says wing, and the right one says center. And then the switches are three position. So in the middle, what position are we in? Normal. And we go aft, we go to stop, and what happens if we go forward? Override. Override. All right. So normal position. What we're doing is we're allowing the fuel computer to manage the fuel from our external tanks normally. Okay? Nothing to it. Uh, just as a point of note here, you know you will not start burning from the external tanks until you get airborne. It won't start using that fuel until you are airborne. Then it'll start taking the fuel out of the externals. Um, what do you think would happen if you select the stop position on, those, on one of those switches? Uh, all transfer on the wing would stop? Well, you would stop transfer out of that tank or tanks that you've selected either your centerline tank or if you have one or two wing tanks, you will stop the transfer out of those tanks. It'll stop. You're telling a fuel computer, stop taking fuel from that tank. So what do you think would happen if we select override? Uh, it begins to transfer out of those tanks. You're right. What you're telling, you're giving instruction to your fuel computer, you're telling it to, uh, let's say you select the center to override. And we've got three bags like we do right here today. What we're telling the fuel computer is, first, stop taking fuel from the wing tanks. Now, take the fuel from the center line right now and put it somewhere. Get it out of that tank as quick as you can. And it will stop taking from the wing tanks until it has emptied the center tank. When the center tank goes empty, it will automatically start taking fuel out of the wing tanks again. And just the opposite occurs if we select the wing to override. You're telling it to stop taking fuel from the center line until the wing tanks are empty. Then it'll start taking from the center line again. Gotcha. Okay. So that is the function of that. You're just sending new instructions to the fuel computer. If for whatever reason, if say you wanted to get rid of one of those tanks quickly, you could you you could do that. Say you're riding double ugly and you want to get rid of that wing tank out there. You can select wing, let it take all the fuel out of that tank, and then drop it and be done with it. Yay, we're done with it. No more double ugly. Okay? All right, uh, our dump switch next over there. Uh, you'll notice if you click on that dump switch that the switch will not stay on. Why won't the switch stay on? No power. Yeah, no power. But if I select a uh, external tank to override, that switch will stay in override. I can select it back to normal, I can select it to stop, and it'll it'll stay at stop and go back to normal. But the the dump switch, it won't stay on. So internally, what do you suppose we have in there that keeps that dump switch turned off? Uh it uh probably gets a signal from the uh if Well it's... not no, I mean just physically. Uh, mechanically, oh, a, a valve, some sort of. Well, not a valve, but a spring, and just a simple little spring mechanism. Oh, spring. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and the it's, switch itself. Okay. Yeah, and the yeah. switch itself. That's what I'm talking about. And the switch itself. It's spring loaded to the offside. So, right. in order to override that spring, what they've done in there is they put a little electromagnet that is controlled by a solenoid. So when the solenoid is powered, the electromagnet is powered. And when the electromagnet is powered and I push that switch up and contact that electromagnet, it'll now override that spring and hold that switch in the on position. 
Now, so it, so it fails. It fails in the off. Pretty much. It fails in the off. That's correct. So you your switch cannot fail on the dump side. But the other thing is, you can now use power to that solenoid to automatically turn that switch off in certain scenarios, such as setting a bingo fuel setting. Bingo, right? Yep. You set your bingo. You start dumping. When you hit bingo, guess what? The fuel computer says we're at bingo. It turns off the power to the solenoid. The solenoid releases the power to a little electromagnet. It releases a switch. The swing flops the switch. Springs the swing. The spring flops the switch to the off position. Your airplane stops dumping. As long as that switch is held on, it will dump. But that spring lets go, that electromagnet lets go, the spring pulls that switch back to off, your airplane stops dumping. Gotcha. Okay. That makes An sense. Another thing that'll turn it off, a low fuel. If you're dumping and you get a low fuel warning, it will it will release that dump switch. You'll stop dumping. There is one other function in the Hornet that will turn it off and I'm not exactly clear on exact numbers that it's looking for, but I do know it is based on your rate of fuel usage. If you're using fuel at a high rate and you dump down to a point that at your that would give you less than, and I'm not sure it's like 15 to 20 minutes of flight time, at your current usage rate with the fuel remaining, even though you haven't reached your bingo yet, it will stop dumping based on the amount of time you have available to fly at your current burn rate. That's another function that you'll, occasionally you may run into that. Okay. Um, now, there's one other switch in our fuel system. Right above our probe, there's another switch up there right behind your external light. You see that one? The uh, looks like an in internal wing. Yep, internal wing. Normal and inhibit. Any idea what that's going to do for you? No clue. Let's say you're just out flying around having a good time. It's a nice, bright, sunny day. You're enjoying the flight. Uh, everything's just going peachy. And for some unknown reason, somebody gets pissed off at you, and they shoot a big hole in your wing. So now you got that big hole out there in your wing, and all the gas out there in that wing tank <laughs> drops right away. Hey, you go, crap. I got to go to the tanker and get more gas. So you fly up to the tanker and you plug in and you start taking gas. Where is that gas going to go? I think you're going to start pumping the gas out that big hole in your wing. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. If you fill the wing, uh, it fills all the tanks at the same time. I'm trying to figure out how, trying to remember uh, which tanks to fill. But I guess they all yeah. fill at the same time. So, yeah, it's going to go right out the hole, the new hole. So now the tanker pilot's going to get all pissed off at you and pull his hose in and say, screw you, I'm not pumping gas out in the air. Right. So what they did, they gave you a switch to fix that. Uh, internal wing inhibit. What it does, you're telling the fuel computer to quit feeding from your wing tanks and do not refuel the wing tanks. Gotcha. Okay. Any remaining fuel in the wing tanks will trickle drain to their respective transfer tanks. So like if one side had a hole and the other side didn't, eventually that right that other side fuel will drain into the system. You will get, get to use it. But the main thing is you stop refueling the wing tanks. Right. So when you plug into the tanker, you won't be pumping gas through that big hole in the wing. Okay? Gotcha. Handy switch. Uh, right above that, we have all our external lights. Uh, those are all self-explanatory. Uh, right to the left of that, 
we have another red guarded switch. What switch is that over there? Generator uh, control. Yeah, gen tie control. Generator tie control. Any idea what that's going to do for you? Don't know. Um, have you ever worked on electrics in, in, in an airplane or messed with it? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Um, did you ever watch The Matrix? Yeah. Yeah, sure, everybody has. You remember in the first one when, when Neo was uh, talking to Morpheus? And Morpheus is telling him, uh, he's offering him these two pills. You can take the right. red pill or mm -hmm. the blue pill. One pill, you go back to your life. The other, you go down the rabbit hole and you learn what things are really about. Yeah. yeah. You're about to take that other pill. Um, generator. The airplane has two generators. Uh, these generators, they're AC generators. They put out 115 volts. 400 cycles of power to uh, your bus system. Um, and actually, these these generators in this airplane, they're pretty good-sized generators. Uh, they're 75,000 volt amp generators. That's pretty good size. Um, in the 7.4, we had 60,000 volt amp generators, only we had four of them on the airplane. But this Hornet has 275. That's pretty good size. Um, the way a generator works uh, is you have an armature that rotates. And on the armature, you have three poles that have the copper wire windings around these poles that rotate uh, on this armature. And on the right. outside of your generator case, uh, you have what is called a, a permanent magnetic generator that generates a magnetic field around this generator. And when you rotate these copper wire poles through this magnetic field, it generates AC current. Each pole generates approximately 40 volts of AC power. And what they do is they, they letter each one of these poles, they call them A, B, and C. So it's called, your, they actually call them the phases, the A phase, B phase, and C phase coming out. You combine each phase coming out, 40 volts, combines to 120. That goes into what's called a generator control unit that regulates that voltage down to 115 and 400 cycle. And that is sent out to all your buses where all your circuit breakers are located before it goes to the individual electrical items in your airplane. Now, on the 7.4, when we would start up engine number four, that generator would come up online. And then we would start engine number three up. And when, when the engine number three generator comes up online, what it would do is we had equipment on the airplane that would parallel a generator, the generators together so they match. In order to parallel generators, you have to get the poles to match each other in rotation. So the phases were exactly aligned. You had to have the A and A phase and the B and B and the C and C phases all working together exactly to parallel generators. If those phases don't work together, you cannot parallel generators. You'll create, create this huge electrical fire. And then two would start and parallel itself to the other th two, and then one would start. So we end up with four generators running in parallel. Then what happens if we lose a generator all we'd see on the load meter is a little bump in power as the other three generators pick that load up. Well, in the Hornet, they're not going to put the extra equipment you need to parallel these two generators. So what that means is we have to keep these generators separated. We have a left generator and a right generator, and never will they work together. The left side runs the left side, the right side runs the right side. But what happens if one of them fails or that engine quits? Then we have to be able to use that other remaining generator to now run both sides of the airplane. And the way it does that is through a generator tie control. The tie control controls a relay 
which it'll either open or close depending on the need of the airplane. When you first start your airplane up, we always start the right engine first. Why do we do the right one first? Because that's where the, the main generator is. Well, no, no. Both generators are exactly the same. It doesn't have anything to do with electricity. The reason we start the right one first is because of hydraulic pressure. Hydraulics, okay. Your brakes are operated on the right hydraulic system. You want to have positive hydraulic pressure available to your brakes when we're bringing up a force that will cause the airplane to move. We want to make sure we have the brakes to stop it from moving. That's why we always start the right one first. So that right engine cranks up, and, it, and when you get the idle RPM, you have enough rotation to get that generator online, and that right generator comes up online, and what the gen tie control does is it sees power on the right side, and it sees the left side doesn't have any power, so it'll close that relay and allow the right generator to now power both sides of your airplane. So everything comes up in your cockpit. Then when we start the left engine and that generator is now coming up online, that gen tie control sees that we now have power coming up on the left side. So what it will do, it'll open that relay and knock that right generator off the left side and allow now allow the left generator to run the left side and the right generator to run the right side. And that's how it does normally when you're operating until you lose a generator or lose an engine. That tie control sees the loss of power, closes, allows that other main generator to run both sides. <clears throat> they have this modeled here in DCS. I've seen a couple of times, especially doing engine out training, where you shut down one engine in flight, particularly shutting down the left engine. Sometimes that tie control doesn't close. And what you end up doing is losing power to half your airplane. And if you look down, you'll see a uh, gen tie annunciator light on your annunciator panel down on the bottom right side. And all you do is you come over here and you raise that guard and you select that switch to override. I mean to reset and back to normal. And that'll get your generator, that'll get your electrical system back in normal operation. And that's functional in here. Oh, okay. Pretty neat. All right, let's bring our throttles back. Uh, next, above our in external light panel, we have our external power switches. Uh, five switches there for external power, unlike other airplanes that normally have just one switch for external power, either external power is on or off. It's not that way in the Hornet. Um, each one of those you have on the back right, you have your external power reset, normal and off switch. You see that one? I do. And then above that, we have switches one, two, three, and four, and they have an A side and a B side. What the Hornet has the ability to do is to allow a maintenance crew to come out and say, avionics wants to work just on the radio. Well, there's a placard on the left side of the cockpit below your big red dispenser button. And you can look at that placard and you can see what each switch in each position powers. So if you want to get just the avionics, the avionics guy can look under there, but he probably knows by now exactly which switches to put either in A or B to get power on the equipment he wants to work on without having to power up the whole airplane. For us as pilots, if you need to use external power to start, the switches, the switch configuration you're going to use are switches one, two, and four, all to the B side. We'll give you proper configuration to start the Hornet. Have you ever used one, external two, power? Four. Yeah. Now, 
What I'm going to do, go over here on the right side and turn your battery to on. Okay. You'll notice the battery gauge right in front of your left generator. I do. You got two batteries there, utility and emergency. And um, the one thing about uh, DCS, when you come out here, even just sitting in a in a uh, cold airplane, your batteries will deteriorate. They'll if you sit out here a couple of hours, you look down, your batteries will be way down. Even right now, they're down from what the from when from when we first started. You see those little uh, uh, carrot pointers on your batteries? Mm -hmm. on the, you know what those show you? They show you the uh, minimum uh, for if it goes below that, you're going to need ground power. Right. Why is that? That's that's exactly what it shows you. But why? Why is that? What's that minimum showing you exactly? The uh, minimum. Uh, well, minimum you know, minimum voltage to do what? To start the aircraft. Yeah, but specifically, what what is that battery power used for during the starting? Uh, uh, APU. No, not the APU. What it's used for is. Whenever you start a turbine engine, right? You got to get it to rotate, All right? The engine starts rotating, starts sucking air through it. The, the bleed air. Well, no, we're just we're just drawing air into the engine right now. Okay. Uh, we go through the compressor, and then this uh, this air is being compressed. The pressure is building up, so the temperature, and the air gets dumped into the burner can. There, the air is mixed with atomized fuel. And inside there, we have two igniters. They're mounted on the engine approximately 180 degrees apart from each other. And they're just like spark plugs in your car, except they're very high power spark plug. I know on the 7.4, those engines, we had 20 joule igniters. It took 20 joules of electricity to fire the igniters. It took a very hot tip on that igniter to ignite that fuel air mixture, get it going. I'm assuming the horn is probably pretty close to that. 20 joules of electricity. Is it a spark igniter or like a glow it's, bar? It, it's, uh, well, it's just like a spark plug. Yeah, okay, spark plug. Okay. Uh, actually, and when you hear them, when you hear one going, it makes a clicking sound. Yeah, you could hear it really well on the. 34 and the T6s. Yeah, yeah, and that's the igniters. They're, yeah, they're clicking. Because, uh, yeah, they don't, yeah, it's not like a glow wire that heats up. It's actually clicking. It's sparking each time. Right. Um, but what these, what the battery does is charge a capacitor to power the igniter. And if the battery voltage gets below that mark, it no longer has enough power to charge the capacitor to fire the igniter, and your engine won't light off. I see. Okay. That's why you need the ground power. Now, call up your ground crew and ask them to connect ground power. So, what we're going to do now? We got we got ground power hooked up. So, come over to your external power switch first, the one on the back right, and select a reset and back to uh, normal. And you'll notice you get your gear lights on. You got the master caution. You got some enunciator lights on the right which, side. Which which one was it? Uh, the, your external power switch, the one on the back right. Just select it. Just right click on it up to reset and let it go and come back to normal. Okay. And you'll get those lights on right now. You see those? I see them. And now, what we're going to do is we're going to left click on button on switch number one and hold it for at least three seconds until it stays held in the B side. So left click okay. on one, hold it for at least three seconds. Got it. Let it go and it'll stay. Now do the thing to two and four. Got it. And there is the setup for using ground power to start your airplane. 
Roger. Okay. If you turn your battery on, you look over there, you'll see your battery voltage is back way up to almost normal now. Okay. That's our ground power setting. Um, okay. Next, we've got our uh, fire test. You got your A and B test. Um, in real life, you know, it actually tests the integrity of all the fire loops. Um, I don't know if you know how, how a fire loop actually works, but it's there are two dissimilar metals that go through that loop around the engine. That each engine has two loops. And a temperature change causes the metals to expand and make contact, and that closes the circuit right. and gives you the fire. Uh, your bleed air also has uh, a sensor, uh, overheat, overheat sensors. In the bleed air duct, should you develop a leak, uh, it will it will set your bleed air uh, overheat warning off. In addition, it will close the bleed valves from the engine during that test. That's why if you do the fire test, after you start the engines up, you need to come over and rotate your bleed air knob 360 degrees to reopen all your bleed air valves. Um, which brings us up to bleed. What is bleed air? Do you know what bleed air is? Uh, uh, air that's it doesn't. It comes into the engine, but it's bypassed kind of to uh, operate other things in the uh, before yep. it gets ignited. This is a nice picture here of jet engine. Yeah, GE F four hundred four, GE four hundred two engine, or a pod racer. <laughs> That's right. Could be a pod racer. Um, now it lists at the top. It says it's an afterburning turbofan engine. They left one word out. It's a afterburning low bypass turbofan. Engine. Um, early jet engines were called turbojets. As the engine has evolved, like this one here. It's called a turbofan. You know why it's called a turbofan? No. If you look at, at the sections of fan sections inside the engine, you see those three sections up front? Mm -hmm. That is the fan section uh, of the engine. Then we have seven stages of compressor behind that. Those are actually compressor stages behind that. So the fans are in the front, the compressors in the back. Early turbine engines did not have fans. It was just all compressor up front. And then the air. So what happens is the air enters the front of the engine, goes through the fans, hits the compressor, and each stage gets smaller and smaller, compressing the air. So when we compress the air, we cause two things to happen. The pressure goes up, and so does the temperature. temperature. Yep. And then that hot, high-pressure air is dumped into the burner can. Now, in this burner can, that hot, high-pressure air is mixed with atomized fuel. Your fuel system in your airplane, you have the fuel coming out of your feed tanks. Uh, being fed up to an engine-driven fuel pump. Uh, your feed tanks have fuel pumps that are going to put the pressure out at around 35 to 45 PSI, up to the engine-driven pump. That engine-driven pump is going to take that fuel and run it up to 1,100 PSI. Very high pressure. What happens is when the fuel comes out of the nozzle there in the burner can, it comes out as a mist. You know, you could take a can of jet fuel and throw a match in it, and it would probably put the match put the out. Match out yeah. yeah. But if you were to take that same jet fuel and spray it with an atomizer and put a flame in front of it, woof, it's going to light off. So that's what we have to do is we atomize the fuel, 
mix it with the air, and during the start process, the igniter fires and lights it off. Now we get a rapidly rising pressure that's going to escape out the back of the burner can, and the first thing it hits is a turbine blade. That turbine blade's going to extract some of the heat energy of that escaping hot gas and turn the shaft that's going to rotate the compressors right up there, those seven stages. And we continue back. We hit a second turbine blade, and it's going to turn the shaft that's going to turn the fan section up front. And then that air is going to continue down the exhaust, and we're going to go past the afterburner ring. Here, we can dump more raw fuel right here with another igniter to ignite that fuel and bump our power up even more. You can go from 11,000 pounds of thrust up to 17,750 pounds of thrust, and you come back out the variable exhaust nozzle. Now, up front, the fan section, they call this a low bypass turbine, turbofan, because 33% of the air coming in the front of the engine is bypassed. If you look above your compressor, you'll see two separate cases, an outer case and an inner case. You see those? Uh, yes. That is where the bypassed air is going through. Then you can follow that, that those two separate cases past the hot section. And what that bypass air does, it'll provide additional cooling around the hot section of the engine. And that air will continue on down those two separate cases until just back at the variable exhaust nozzle, it'll get dumped into the tailpipe back there and then out the tailpipe. Okay. Bleed air. You'll notice above the seventh stage of compressor, that's the last stage, mm -hmm. there's an opening, uh, uh, an opening above that stage. What okay. they have on there, they have valves inside there that open up and extract air off that seventh stage. So that's going to be very hot very high pressure air and we're going to route it into the into the airplane and use that air for several things one thing we already know about is the o box we extract o2 out of that air use it for our breathing another thing your g suit pressure comes from bleed air okay um we run it into our pressurization and air conditioning system um, through uh, what's called an air cycle machine. And we can generate very cold air going through an air cycle machine. And now we can mix that very cold with the hot air and come up and be able to regulate the temperature in the cockpit. Uh, we also take that high-pressure air and bump it into the cockpit to pressurize the cockpit. We also use that hot bleed air to route around the intakes of the engines when we're wanting uh, inlet anti-ice. When we turn that engine heat on, that's where we're the, the heat source for that to keep ice from forming on our inlets. Uh, okay. Also, in our fuel system, You know, uh, liquids, uh, what happens to the boiling point of liquid as you raise, uh, as you go up in altitude? It uh, uh, lowers. It does, yeah. That's why, like if you live in Denver and you want to boil an egg, instead of taking 10 to 12 minutes to boil an egg, it may take you 16 to 18 minutes because the water is boiling off at a lot lower temperature than it does down at sea level. Well, the same thing happens to fuel. As you go up in altitude, uh, the pressure decreases to the point where fuel can start to vaporize in the, in the fuel system. 
and you can actually start getting fuel bubbles in the fuel system, which is bad for an engine because it won't run on fuel bubbles, you know, air bubbles in your fuel right? because the fuel is starting to vaporize. So what they do is they take bleed air and pump it in on top of the fuel tanks to keep a positive pressure on the fuel tanks to counteract the, the pressure loss for altitude. Another thing, how do we get fuel out of the external tanks into the fuel system? Uh, fuel bleed, pump? Bleed air. air. Yep, it uses bleed air. There's no fuel pump pumping that gas out. There's no fuel pump in the external tanks. All you so do is hook up pressure to the inside of the tank and it right. closes it out of the tank. Right. Just pump that pressure up and push that fuel right out of there. That way, when you drop it, you haven't, I mean, all you're doing is dropping a tank. You don't have a fuel pump in there. You don't have a fuel pump you're having to carry on an airplane to use for a tank that you no longer have. I see. Okay. Just added weight. You don't have to carry. So now we can just hook up a, a bleed air pressure line. And when we're done with it, nothing's changed on the way to the airplane. You know, as far as uh, having to add any extra equipment, bleed air, what a handy thing to have. Okay, <laughs> pretty neat. Yeah. If you look at this diagram real close between the fan and the compressor, you look inside there, you can see that planetary gear in there, that one that, that goes around. After the compressor? Well, behind, bet between the fan and the compressor, there's a cutaway there. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. See that cutaway? Inside it. that cutaway, you can see that planetary gear, and right. there would be a satellite gear that it drives that would turn the shaft that goes to your AMAD, your airframe mounted auxiliary drive, that then drives all your accessories. But that's where that comes from. Pretty gotcha. neat engine they have in, on this thing.